It's great to be with you. Um, I'm fighting a cold, so we're, we're doing the best that we can with what we've got here. So now I keep asking every service, what time do we typically end? <laughs> Pastor Glenn says around 1 or 10 past. Is he telling me the truth? Yes. Okay. So let's go. It's a privilege to share this message with you today because I have to tell you, it's, I've probably labored more over this message than maybe any I've ever presented in my whole ministry. And you would think that it would be simple just to go back and say, what was the vision that God gave for the starting of this church? So I want to get right to it and, and try to share with you the things that I believe the Lord has for you today some of them historic, some of them current, some of them forward-looking. The text for my message today is found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8. It's one verse. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, in these next moments, I pray for the precious anointing of your Holy Spirit just blow away, Lord, any thoughts, uh, any words that would not be important to share. I come and stand today against every distraction uh, in any way that your word, your precious, simple word will go forth like so uh, seed to be planted in the soil of our good hearts, Lord. We thank you today for your word and for what you've already done in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. When Pastor Glenn asked me to speak today, it wasn't until later looking at the calendar and working things out, and I, I don't know if I've told you this, but I send you greetings from a precious group of believers in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. And the name of the church is Life Chapel, and this coming summer, Patty and I will celebrate our ninth year at Life Chapel, which, again, I'm blown away by how time seems to fly. There were 17 people, literally, including the church mouse, I think we counted the mouse that day, on the first Sunday that we went to share God's word with them. Uh, last Sunday, I think there was right somewhere around 325 people that gathered for worship. And the church is growing, coming to life. And really finding a place of influence in the community there. Point Pleasant's a small town, a small beach town in New Jersey. And in fact, you probably saw that name when Sandy, Superstorm Sandy came. That's where the, the people were standing giving the report. You don't want people in your town giving the report in the midst of a storm like that. So some people are still recovering from the massive damage that was done. Pastor Glenn asked me to speak today, December 3rd, 2017. So I went back and looked at the calendar. I went, wait a minute. And so I went on my computer and I just punched in uh, calendar for December 1983. And I, I, I later realized, and I shared with him, I said, Pastor Glenn, today marks the 34th anniversary almost to the day because in 1983, it was Sunday, December 4th, 1983, that Harvest Time had its very first service, four o'clock in the afternoon in the basement of the YMCA. We immediately followed Alco Alcoholics Anonymous group. The, the room was filled with smoke and it twerked the Holy Ghost, okay? That's all I can tell you. <laughs> uh, just out of curiosity, was anybody at that meeting, the very first meeting back in, yeah, see, it's just Patty and me. We are the only relics, I think, that are left. That's it. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the beginning, that was the birthing of Harvest Time Church. Since that time, many things have changed. We've all changed. Uh, a lot has changed in and around this community. But as I thought about today's message, the Lord highlighted for me three things 
at Harvest Time Church that have never and will never change. And I want to share them with you today and then along the way give you a little bit of our story, our story. The first thing is that has never changed. And the reason these things will not change is because they originated in the heart of Abba, Abba Father. Okay, it's who he is. So the first thing that never changes is the mission. The mission. Matthew 28 and verse 19. And this passage of scripture is commonly called the Great Commission. All right? And here it is. Jesus is speaking and he says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Harvest Time Church is a very mission or missions oriented church because it was founded by nationally appointed Assemblies of God home missionaries. Now, you would think that this would be so obvious that I would have thought and connected from the beginning, but it wasn't until this week that I felt like the Lord just said to me, Ray, do you, you know why Harvest Time Church is so strong when it comes to missions? It's because I started this church with two young missionaries called Ray and Patty Tate. Patty and I had received national appointment from the Assemblies of God as home missionaries, meaning that not only did the Southern New England District of the Assemblies of God fully support us, and uh, you know, what an amazing thing. Southern New England District of the Assemblies fully paid for Patty's and my salary, and they also paid for uh, rent so that we could rent the building for one whole year when we first came here. And so your church was started by missionaries. How many of you know, like father, like son, the, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, right? And I just feel like it's in our DNA, mission. It's a part of who we are, and it's how God birthed us from the very beginning. Pastor Glenn asked me to share the original version, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, from the original version, the, from the original Greek, uh, the original vision that God had given to us for the starting of this church. So I've, I've written it in a paragraph form. So if you're taking notes, it's not very long, but this is it. I thought about it, and, and over the years, so many times, uh, I reflected upon it. When we prayed about this church, the Lord put it in my heart that Harvest Time Church would become a church of 1,000 people where individuals were being saved, baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit, discipled, equipped, and sent out as ambassadors for Jesus Christ to the workplace, to the church, and to the world. Exclamation point. There it is. The vision. God bless you. Good to be with you today. Oh, don't you wish? You'd be like, oh, that would be so great. That was the vision that God planted in our hearts. And I have to tell you, in, in almost 40 years of ministry, and we've been in four churches. We were a youth pastor before we came here. We started this church. Then we went to uh, Cherry Hill and pastored Kingsway Church for 10 years, and now in Point Pleasant Life Chapel for nine years. But this is the only church that when we first went and I prayed, God, what do you want for this place? This is the only one that he, he appointed a number to the vision. I find that interesting. I didn't ask him for a number. I just said, Lord, what do you see? What are you going to build here? And he said, I'm going to make this to be a church of a thousand strong. 34 years later, almost to the day, here we are together, a few feet away from a building that seats how many people? Oh my goodness. Do you see how faithful God is? It wasn't my idea. This is not my vision. This was God's vision that he gave to us and said, this is what I've got in store for this place. You know, even I was, we were kind of comparing notes and reminded that when Patty and I first moved to town, the United States government created a new law. And they said, we now believe that churches should be able to rent public buildings. 
That law came into effect after we moved into town. And because of that change, we were able to rent the Western Greenwich Civic Center for almost 20 years. Now, you say what well, the whole nation was affected. Yeah, but God did it for us. <laughs> and, you know, and then we talked about how that the town kind of changed the rules a little bit so that this church would be able to build so much building on this piece of land. And on and on the miracles go. You know, all praise and glory. Bow down and worship him. Worship him, Jesus, our Lord. So the church was only six months old, and I felt the nudge of the Lord that we were to support, begin supporting our first missionary on a monthly basis. How many of you ever argued with the Lord? Am I the only one in the house? I'll be honest with you, and it went something like this. I was like, Lord, that's a good idea, but I have to tell you something. Lord, and, and I remember, this was my sentence, if we gave every penny, if we saved every penny that the church will ever take in to someday hope to buy a building, a put buy land and buy a building, I said, it probably could never happen. So Lord, how in the world do you think we could begin to support missionaries? It does not make sense. Thinking that I had convinced the Lord, it's like, you know, you get this idea. He just waits for you to finish. It's like, are you finished, Ray? Okay, so like I said, I want Harvest Time to start supporting its first missionary. So I spoke with the leadership at, at that time and uh, found a, a unity of heart to say, let's do it. So six months into the journey, we were meeting in the um, YMCA on Sundays. We were meeting in our home on Wednesday nights. We had a life group that met there on Wednesday nights. And we announced to the small group of people that we're going to start supporting our first missionary. And so we took into our church family a missionary by the name of Paul and his wife, Meshteld Clark, missionaries that were going to Germany. They came, they smoked, they... they <laughs> They just, you know, they just, uh, <laughs> oh, forgive me. <laughs> Bill, help me out, will you, Bill? Just something, something. <clears throat> they came and they spoke <laughs> to the small group of people that were gathered that night. And just imagine that six months as a church, we started supporting our first missionary. And now Pastor Glenn announced today that you're currently supporting 60 missionaries on a monthly basis. And you are still supporting Paul and Meshtel Clark. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So the Lord's response to me when I finally said, Lord, okay, we're going to do it. But man, it doesn't make sense. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Ray, please know Every penny that Harvest Time gives to missions is going to be making a deposit in my heavenly bank. You fast forward that tape 15 years when it came time for the church to buy this building, which was another miracle in itself. Can I tell you how, how uh, intricate the, uh, the thought was? Denise was working at Town Hall at the time. She gathered the names of all every person that owned 10 acres or more. Not that it was for sale. They just owned 10 acres or more. She got all that information. We wrote a simple letter introducing the church that we were looking for land if there was any interest. We brought them into the church. We had a pile, prayed over those letters, mailed them out. One response came. One. He, he said, yeah. I've got 10 acres, let's talk. We met in one of the parishioners' homes, the owner there, and he said, yeah, I'd be willing to sell it for a million and a half. We went back and, and took a look, and the church had already saved $1 million, close to a million dollars, in building fund. Just out of curiosity, went to the bookkeeper to say, over the last 15 years, how much money have we given to missions? And Chickie came back later that week and said, 
It's around a million dollars. Do you remember that heavenly bank thing? So before coming here today, I, uh, uh, I asked Faith to ask Chicky. by the way, since we left, since 1998 to this current date, how much money has uh, Harvest Time given to missions? And she said that the church has given directly to missions uh, $5 million. And in addition, you've had missionaries, special offerings, et cetera, et cetera, which brings you closer to like $7 million you have given to missions. So whenever you set out to do something, mark my words, when you set out to do something for the Lord, someone's going to criticize you. Oh, you did too much of this. You didn't do enough of that. Oh, it's too extravagant. Oh, you know. So I'm going to criticize you right now to your face. Might as well, right? I don't want you to hear about it from somebody else. I'm going to criticize you, Harvest Time, for being too extravagant in your giving to missions. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Maybe better, who do we know he is? Yeah. Hallelujah. So, here's what I believe. I believe with all of my heart that based on God's promise and his help to us in the past, that somewhere in his heavenly bank is just $7 million sitting there somehow waiting to be deposited, harvested here to this church to help you move forward into that project over there. Now, that's what only God can do. Okay? So that's, number one, is our mission. I want to talk to you, number two, about our source. I want to talk about your source, my source, the church's source. It says, now I'm going to share a scripture with you. I want you to make note of in your Bibles. I want you to reflect on because over my years in ministry, uh, I find that oftentimes when it comes to this one issue, a lot of times people can get very um, sensitive or defensive or whatever. I don't know if you have any idea what that issue might be. I'll, I'll, before you start sharing and shouting out loud, let me just tell you what it is. It's money. The issue of money can be very sensitive. Someone told me as a young man, I was working as a teller at a bank. They said, be careful. You touch people's money, they get very upset. And boy, I tell you, if you made, made a mistake in the, the, with pennies given back to the customer, you knew that they'd be there saying, hey, where are my five pennies, you know? You, you, so the issue of money, the source, what is your source? I'm going to just ask you, don't answer out loud. I want you to think honestly and hardly, uh, like deeply on this question. Who or what is your source? I want to read to you because a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, tithing is an Old Testament concept. We're living in grace and then it usually follows with this sentence, all I have belongs to God. Hallelujah. Doesn't that sound spiritual? All I have is just belongs to God. Right. We say that, but often we say that to get us out of what the Scripture has to say is what God expects and requires for us as his children, if we're going to follow in obedience to him, concerning the money that he places in our hands. I would say to you this, that, and again, I just want to point this out. Pastor Glenn, all he said to me was, whatever the Lord puts in your heart, share it. I didn't want to talk about money today. I made it to Friday of this week thinking, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's not on my outline. And then Friday, I felt the Lord say, there's one more thing. Because, you know, look, we want to believe God to do his part. Amen? But he wants us to do our part. You can't have one without the other. And so I, I want you to see that from the words of Jesus himself, Matthew 23 and verse 23, this is Jesus speaking. 
He's speaking to the religious leaders. He said, what sorrow awaits you, you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of your herb gardens, but you ignore the what? The weightier or more important aspects of the law. And they are justice, mercy, and faith. So before I read the next line, here's what I want you to see about this issue of money. If we fight God on the issue of his tithe, then mark my words, your whole life, money is going to be an issue or a problem for you. I'm not going to read it, but you mark it down. Malachi chapter 3 makes it very clear that the tithe belongs to the Lord, and if we will give it back to him, he says, I will bless you in such a way that I'm going to open up windows of blessing over your life. Not all of that's money, unless we've made money the most important part of our life. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Don't make money the issue. Make God your source. Make him the source of all that you have and all that you will ever be. And if you get that right, then money becomes just a buy thing. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, I'm going to trust God. But before I do, I'm going to give the Lord his tithe. Every Sunday when, when I, Patty and I go to church, now I'm, I'm an old dog that learned new tricks. Because we were on sabbatical this summer, my wife and I. So I always would sit in the front row, and I couldn't wait for the usher to come by so that I could model to our church by putting my tithe in the offering basket. I didn't do it to be proud or haughty. I wanted to just be an example. But then while we were away, I'm like, I can't put that in it. How am I going to do this? And I'm reminded we have electronic giving. And I was always like, I don't like that because I want to put it in the bag. <laughs> I said, well, I'll do it. <clears throat> so Patty and I, we now give our tithe weekly, electronically, so that even before Sunday comes around, I think it's on Friday, we place our tithe and our offering in for the following week. I want to say this clearly to you guys. Don't ever look at Pastor Glenn and think, he's just talking about money because he's the pastor. I want to tell you firsthand, I don't ever want to talk about money. I don't ever want to talk about your money, right? I don't, because that's between you and God. But if I wasn't worth my weight in salt, how could I not tell you what God has said about your money? Yeah. It's not me. And mark my words, once you get this straight, you will be amazed at just the simple faithfulness and goodness of the Lord as your source over your life. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you're going to do it. A tough subject, but he's a good God. He's a faithful God. So uh, this, this idea of the tithe belongs to the Lord, here's what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23. And please, mark your Bibles if you've got it. Jesus said, yes, you should tithe. Done. New Testament, Jesus, yes, you should tithe. So now it's between you and the Lord. But I felt that the Lord would have me share that with you, not as a rebuke, not even as a challenge, but as an encouragement. Hey, let's do it God's way and then trust him to take care of the rest in our lives and in our church. If you agree, would you say amen? Amen. And then the last thing that never changes here. We talked first, the mission never changes. The source never changes. And finally, the harvest. The harvest. John 4 and verse 35, Jesus speaking says, Do you, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are already white for the harvest. My wife, Patty, 
two other friends of ours, Rose and Jack Egan, and I, in the autumn of 1983, a few months before we moved to Greenwich, we sat around their table in Wyckoff, New Jersey, with each of our Bibles open, notepads, and we, we, were, we gathered for this purpose. Let's to get together tonight and just kind of talk, open our Bibles, and let's just talk about verses and, and all to see if the Lord might help us to, to discover the name for this church. And we kept coming back to John chapter 4. And of course, there in John chapter 4 and verse 35, once that verse seemed to just be, be the verse that kept coming to us, and we talked a lot back and forth about the meaning and all, I have to tell you that it was at that time that not only was the name Harvest Time born from John 4.35, but all of the questions that I had as to why would the Lord call us to a town that we really had never been and people we didn't know, why would he do this? And the Lord began to show us that it was all about the harvest. The harvest of people. Jesus loves people. He loves your neighbors. He loves the people you work with, the students you go to school with. He loves the neighbors around this building. Jesus is all about the harvest. And I want to just proclaim today that the harvest in Greenwich and the surrounding towns is still very great. And Jesus is still Lord of the harvest. The principles of sowing and reaping are so closely connected to the whole concept of the harvest. And I would like today, uh, at this part of the service, and then we'll end by giving you an opportunity to come and we'll pray together as we close. But right now, would you just bow your heads and give me the privilege of praying over you this prayer of faith and proclamation that the Lord has put in my heart for you. Heavenly Father, I am praying and I am believing that this is a season of harvest for Harvest Time Church in every way. I pray that you, God's people, and you, the church, collectively, may experience an ever-increasing harvest of souls born into the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ, because you are here. I am praying that you as a church might receive a financial harvest from Abba's heavenly bank in response to the $7 million that you have invested in missions since 1998. And I am praying that you as a church might receive a harvest of blessings from Abba, our Father, through the hands of your neighbors, the extended families and friends of those whose lives have been changed because of the light of the gospel that has gone forth into this community because of this community of Christ followers known as Harvest Time Church for these past 34 years. Lord, we thank you now in advance for the great harvest that has already come. It is white unto harvest. It's ready to be deposited. And Father, we give you praise that you who have begun this good work shall be faithful to complete it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.